Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future. And by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Hello, I'm Lorraine Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. Our guest today is one of my favorite writers of all times, Connie Willis. Thank you for joining us. Oh, I'm so glad I could be here. Oh, me too. I'm going to have to brag on you a little bit. You're the winner of 11 Hugo Awards, or maybe more. Yes, no, Seven right. Nebula, more major awards than any other living writing, yeah, writer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you are in the Science Fiction Hall of Fame. You were inducted in 2009. The Science Fiction Writers of America named you a Grand Master yep. in 2011. But you have other skills, too. Apparently, you are, and I've heard you do this in Portales. <laughs> we'll talk about that. You are a stand-up superstar at science fiction conventions. They say that having you as MC is like having Billy Crystal uh. back back at the Oscars. Have well, you I appreciate that? that. <laughs> I appreciate that a lot, yes. And so I have heard you perform in lead panels and mm-hmm. MC at the Jack Williamson Lectureship in Portales. Mm-hmm. I want our audience to know what a treasure we have in Portales. Can you tell oh. us who is Jack Williamson and why do you go there every year? Yes, um, I was invited to the Jack Williamson Lectureship a long time ago as their guest of honor and went and then, um, then a few years later was invited back and as one of several guests. And at that point, I said, you know, I love everybody here, and I, lo- I just love coming, and I love Jack. And so can I please come? <laughs> and I've gone ever since. I've gone every year since. Um, and Jack Williamson is, was one of the forefathers of science fiction. Um, people who might not know the names of some of the books and stories that he wrote would definitely know that he invented the terms genetic engineering, Android, um, artificial intelligence, humanoid, gene mapping. Uh, gene mapping. He just he really invented many of the different kinds of things that we write about in science fiction, and also was uh, as a role model the kindest, loveliest, most gentlemanly person on the planet, and one that pretty much shaped the personality of science fiction for many many years. And he was just absolutely beloved. And uh, for a long time at the lectureship, I went to see Jack. And then after he was gone, we've gone in his memory. And we have writers come every year and from all over. And um, it's just it's a wonderful gathering. And uh, I highly recommend that anybody who can, can get out to Portales, which admittedly is four hours from here, five hours from here. Um, but it's absolutely worth it. You get to mingle with writers and, and readers and, and see um, the Jack Williamson collection at the library. And it's just a beautiful, wonderful experience. And so the lectureship takes p- place in April. And I really, the, yes. the quality of, of workshops and writers that are there is really yes. inspiring. It is. But also, if you can't go in April, the Jack Williamson Special Collection, as you mentioned, right. is in the library. And that is, I think, the third best science fiction collection right. in the right. country, that is, in right. and, and it's one that's unique in that it's open to the public, because many collections are not. And speaking of collections, I am so happy that I've got a collection of your work here. We'll, before we get to the latest ones, I want to go back to this whole series for which you have devout followers, the Oxford Time Travel Series. How did it start? Right. Um, Yeah, it started with a story called Firewatch, uh, which I didn't intend to turn into a series. Uh, It was, I wanted to tell the story about how St. Paul's Cathedral was saved during World War II by this ragtag band of, of, you know, church employees and vergers and choir singers and so on that uh, put out the incendiary bombs on the roof of St. Paul's. Um, And to tell that story, I invented a time traveler who was a student from Oxford who came back and became a member of the Firewatch so that he could observe history at first hand. And then after I did that, then I sort of fell in love with the idea of, of Oxford having time travel and being able to have people do history rather than just read about history. And so um, I then wrote Doomsday Book, which was... Let me just hold okay. this up. This is the current edition. This has won so many awards, and I must tell you, it is a compelling read. I love this book. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Doomsday Book is really grim, as you can probably tell from the title. It's uh, set in, in the Middle Ages and involves the Black Death, kind of the, the dark side of history. 
Um, and after I wrote it, um, I then decided that I really should tell the rest of the story of history because history isn't all just catastrophes and wars and horrible things happening. It's also, you know, boating on the Thames and tea parties and falling in love and, and cats and dogs and all kinds of things. So then I wrote To Say Nothing of the Dog, and, uh, and that was set in Victorian England, which is probably my favorite period of history, and one that I had an enormous amount of trouble with, uh, an, an enormous amount of fun with, because it's a, um, it's a comedy. Uh, and, then, and then I realized that I wasn't done with the Blitz. <laughs> yeah. Even though I'd done St. Paul's, I had the rest of World War II to tell the story of. So, and there are two Blitz books. Right, one is, the one I have here is Blackout, the right. other one is and, All Clear. Right. They're really one. They're really one book. And the, the second half is, is part, I mean, it's two halves of the same novel in two volumes. But, um, and then I got to do Dunkirk and the Evacuated Children and the Blitz and the shop girls that somehow got to work every morning on Oxford Street, even though Oxford Street was on the front lines of the war and tell the story of all the civilians, including Agatha Christie, who's one mm. of my favorites. So, mm. and, and I've just been in love with the time travelers ever since. So. so now we are here to celebrate your new book, I've Waited Six Years. <laughs> I've Waited Six yeah. Years for this. I'm kind of slow. I'm a slow writer. Oh, one thing <laughs> that came out recently, so for people who are just getting started, here's a book called, uh, of your award-winning stories called The Best of Connie Willis. And this is a wonderful way to start. They're short stories. They go from the ridiculous to the sublime, the profound, the tragic. They were just yeah. wonderful stories. Well, thank you. I, I love the short story. It's probably my favorite thing to write. And so I was really excited to have that come out. So Crosstalk. Crosstalk. <laughs> it is like, yes. or it, it combines in a way the, the wit of Nora Ephron, someone said. Oh, wow. That's the, high the praise. The comedic flair of P. G. Woodhouse. Uh, that's even higher praise. And, uh, and uh, it's set in the uh, social media world of today. This is what's so right. wonderful. That we it, all live in. <laughs> you have taken a romantic comedy, the, the, the basis of which historically is that there are all these misunderstandings, but it all turns out. But this is about telepathy. Right. You cannot have misunderstandings, misunderstandings. <laughs> if you're reading each other's mind. Right. Well, what you can, a challenge. But yeah, it was it was tricky because a lot of the where people don't tell their feelings, you know, where they don't they don't let the other person know they're in love with them and all those things, you know, get becomes much trickier if you can read somebody else's mind. But I found that there were still ways to create all kinds of <laughs> miscommunication. And the book is really about communication, because we live in this world where we have all these new forms of communication, you know, email and Twitter and and uh, Facebook and everything, and yet we don't seem to be communicating any better <laughs> than we were before. And a lot, of, we're getting lots of information, we're getting, we're saying a lot to each other. We now, you know, we can, if we want to date, we simply swipe right or swipe yeah. left. And we, we can unfriend people and we can change our relationship status on Facebook and all these things. But none of it seems to make our relationships go any better. And that was one thing I really wanted to address. Well, we so. are awash in the sea of information. <sighs> Twitter, <clears throat> it's in a way you show the dark side of right. too much information. Um, you say that if you're going to have a superpower, telepathy is just about the worst it you could is. have. It is. <laughs> uh, I've had people say, oh, telepathy, I, well, that would be so cool to be able to read people's minds. I'm like, you have not thought this through. Uh, telepathy would be a terrible idea. I, for one, I have only managed to survive because people do not know what I'm thinking at any <laughs> given moment, and I'm sure that's true of everybody else. You just, I, I think no marriage could survive for more than 15 minutes if you actually knew every single thought that flitted through your head or your partner's head. I just don't see how it you know, I think a lot of murderous thoughts about my husband, yeah. and we've been married for almost 50 years. So, partly because I don't <clears throat> think, because we don't know what the other one is thinking for sure. We're, we can probably guess, but we don't know for sure. So, so you have combined some really interesting traditions, the romantic comedy tradition and the screwball comedies and all right. these. But right. there is a tradition of telepathy in science fiction. There, there is. Usually a darker, darker much color. Much darker, yes. Very few lighthearted stories about telepathy. Uh, usually it takes the form of world domination, you know, somebody who can read minds and uses it to like become a dictator, or somebody who um, who can hear all these thoughts and becomes maddened by them, you know, because there's this endless input of either horrible thoughts or 
or just too much, you know, um, and and the person can't survive it. So so I, I nobody had really tackled the the humorous or the romantic side of of the of the situation. And I had there had been that one movie with Mel Gibson, the What Women Want. Yeah. And uh, it was a terrible movie, and uh, and that isn't what women want. And <laughs> so yeah. I thought, well, so I thought I would try to tell you a little bit more about what what would really happen if you could read somebody's mind. Um, the 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 whole issue of privacy and and having personal space, all right. of that, you do. So this is set in the kind of not too distant future. Right, and right. A lot it's like the, day after tomorrow. The ideas are about Apple's new phone and the, right. the communication. All of this is very relatable. We all understand. But you also uh, the 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 scientist sort of mm -hmm. um, one of the protagonists comes up with some ideas that please patent them and do them. <laughs> One was a sanctuary for yes. them, and <laughs> yes. the SOS. Yes. Tell us what you... Well, some of the things he comes up these with... These are apps. Sometimes, sometimes in fun, he's coming, sometimes just being sarcastic, and sometimes he's serious, coming up with the whole idea of you could, you could send, um, you could make it so you didn't have to ever answer your phone, that you were immediately, you know, it, it always rang as busy. Also, that you could, if it was someone you really didn't like, you could transfer them to a f horrible phone menu somewhere yeah. <laughs> where <laughs> they were stuck forever waiting to press one if you want to talk to someone who knows yeah. something about this. Press two <laughs> if you don't if you don't care how long you remain yeah. on this. Press three if you want to hear horrible music, et cetera. <laughs> so all the things that we all put up with. Um, and, and he thought of just all kinds of ways where you could, could convince people that, that you were not there and that you were, so you wouldn't have to be at everyone's beck and call at every single second. And so um, I, I, those are things that I personally would like, so so I had him invent them. <laughs> and the so. SOS, you're you're at, on the, the or blind date with right. someone. It's not right. Going the SOS, well. yes, and it's not going well. And you get this call that you have to leave immediately, and your phone automatically rings and gives you an excuse for why yeah. you have to be somewhere oh, excuse else. Excuse me, yes. I have to be gone. Yes. So, and people do varieties of that themselves anyway. But but yes, this would be where the phone was actively helping you <laughs> <laughs> to get out of a bad situation. Yes. You know. So. One of the things, uh, we're speaking today with Connie Will Willis about her wonderful new book, Crosstalk. You have an extraordinary gift for dialogue, I, in particularly your book, Bellwether, that oh, thank I you. loved so much. It was just like, does she hang out in coffee shops and colleges <laughs> with her ear to the I, next table? I do. I <laughs> eavesdrop do. <laughs> shamelessly on people. And uh, I love people's conversations. I have always loved writing dialogue. Um, and. Uh, I, probably the best conversation I overheard, you uh, overhear some amazing things. Um, uh, one was a, a woman who uh, was saying, I don't know why my mother doesn't like him. His parole is up in like three months, <laughs> which I thought was a classic <laughs> line. Um, but my, the best one ever I overheard, uh, I was in the, the hot pool at Glenwood Springs, which if you know that place at all you know it has this wonderful place where you just it's like a gigantic hot tub where everyone sits around the edges and just soaks and gets or you can drift slowly through the middle and these two guys were drifting slowly through the middle and one said to the other and it also the the hot water magnifies the sound so you can hear mm. everyone very clearly and he said so did the people you were house sitting for get back from Europe and the other one said yeah he said so like were they bummed yeah, I told him, houses burned down. <sighs> and then they drifted off oh. out of sight. And I was like, wait, wait, wait. I need oh. to know the rest of this story. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I've never heard the rest of it. Oh. But it has convinced me that eavesdropping is, in fact, a very profitable thing to do. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yes, indeed. But beyond eavesdropping, we are have this barrage of noise and data. Yeah. And I just love that... Um, Oxford's Dictionary Word of the Year was post-truth. Right, yes. And when you think of all the misinformation right. and how tired our brain right. gets from right. discriminating right. truth from lies. And how do you know, and you constantly come up against people who believe things that are plainly not true, and you say, that's not true, and they, but they refuse to accept any standard. There's no standard for telling the truth anymore, apparently. Yeah. And that's a whole other issue is the whole, when you can't share, 
when you don't share the reality, what, what do you do then? It's, that's a very tricky problem and a major problem that we have, I think. So. But there's the oversharing of the misinformation reality and the fact that there's no object, there's no truth anymore. Right. It's right. post-truth. Right. Yeah. Is, yeah. A, is a very, I was frightened to see that that was the OED's word of the year. Yeah. Yeah. I was frightened. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's not good news. Um, so. One of the uh, subjects you go into is brain surgery because these two perhaps intended, uh, you know, male and female protagonist, have this popular celebrity driven new right. brain little surgery. Little tiny brain, little itsy bitsy tiny brain surgery. Where right. it, it helps them understand each other. Right. They can read each other's right. thoughts. They can, read each, they can read each other's emotions. Emotions, That's right. all that's promised. And yeah. then it kind of, there's a problem. There's yeah. complications, of yes. Of course. Right, of course. Of course. So, so um, is this, is this on our horizon? Oh, you know, people will do anything. I mean, they will do anything if celebrities do it, which always just astonishes me. The, the fact that, you know, somebody said, when my editor was talking to me about it, she said, do you really think people could be talked into doing brain surgery? I'm like, well, they've been talked into putting deadly venom into Botox. their faces. Yes. That is venom <laughs> that's going in there. If they can be talked into putting snake venom into their faces, yeah. they can be talked into anything. Yeah. And I, I do see, unfortunately, people doing all kinds of things and on the basis of very little, <laughs> very little rational thought and very little, um, you know, they just don't have to be talked into it. If a celebrity does it, then they're willing to do it, which I also find very frightening. So You did mention but. that the, the brain is like the last frontier. It, oh, it is. And the whole idea of how we how we think and what we think about. And they, you know, there's, there is a new MRI that supposedly can see, like you think about a bird and then they get an image of a bird on the screen. But, but we're still so far from knowing what the actual thought was that you had. I mean, you could have been thinking about, you know, you saw a bird flying by, or you could be thinking about your pet bird or that you'd like to have a pet bird. Yeah. Or you could be thinking about, um, say, a, an eagle, which is a car, you know, or you could be thinking about the Philadelphia yeah. Eagles, which yeah. is a football team. You know, there's, how, how do you distinguish what the actual thought is versus what the images are? And uh, so far, I don't think we're anywhere close to people being actually able to read our minds, which thank goodness, because yeah. at that point, uh, all bets are off. So Yes. Um, one of the reasons I, I love your work so much is that you are such a creative artist and you have invented plausible futures and probable pasts and in, in you, you create worlds and, and I would like you to address the present. Oh gosh, I have been trying for the last however many days it's been since two the weeks. election, two weeks mm -hmm. since the election and, and find myself totally not able to predict. I just, I don't know where we're going. I mean, I, I can set up various scenarios. You know, science fiction writers don't actually predict the future. They extrapolate possible. Mm -hmm. They look at trends and they go, okay, if this goes on in this direction, then we'll be here. Uh, on the other hand, if this goes on, then we'll be over here. Um, they don't actually try to predict in the sense that like Gene Dixon used to predict, you yeah. know, that somebody was gonna die during the year or something. Um, and, but even in terms of extrapolation, I'm not sure what the present is yet. And if you don't know what the present is, it's, it's so much in flux, you know, which way. And every, I, reading the New York Times today about Trump's latest visit with the Times and what he said about climate change and what he said about various topics, I'm just like, I have no idea. I have no idea which direction we're going. We are in sort of a post-truth era <laughs> here. And, and that combined with the fact that uh, nothing, everything is in flux. Um, I, I just, I have no idea. You know, I, I vacillate wildly between uh, various dystopic futures, which I can easily imagine coming out of what's happened recently. And then on the other hand, um, not so dystopic futures, not because I, I distrust the trend lines, but because because history has a way of veering, it doesn't, it doesn't go in straight lines. Yeah. And it can only really, <clears throat> the, the straight lines can only be detected after the fact. And so um, we always end up being surprised by what happens. You know, we can look back at, at the assassination of, you know, um, of the Archduke, Archduke Ferdinand mm -hmm. and what it caused 
afterwards, but going in, we can't. Nobody saw that coming, and nobody could see which direction it was going to go. And so um, that's the advantage of being a historian. You get to go and look back at things. But moving forward, um, it tends to veer. You know, we, we don't... Um, Sometimes things that we're convinced will work out hideously work out better than we think they would, and then other times uh, they work out far worse. And in, but the thing that we dreaded the most doesn't happen, but something even worse over here that we weren't even considering happens. And it's really, it's really tricky. I read, when I was writing Doomsday Book, which is about the Black Death, I, um, I looked at a lot of stuff that was said in, 19, in 1347, the year before the Black Death hit England. And, and people were worried about the shortage of, of labor in various things. They were sh worried about uh, overthrowing the crown. <laughs> in, you know, they were worried about all these different things, which, of course, were all canceled out because the real danger was coming from over here, which nobody saw coming. So I, I you know, yeah, I have indulged in an awful lot of, oh, my gosh, in four years we're all going to be in the camps kind of thinking, which I still don't think is beyond the realm of possibility, unfortunately. I'm very frightened by the rise of white supremacists and the, the, the idea of scapegoating various groups to account for problems that we can't solve. Um, and yeah, it could definitely lead that way. On the other hand, um, we are also forewarned by that. So it's not going to, history doesn't repeat itself. I remember who said it, but they said history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. Yes, and, yes, I <laughs> and love so, that. I, and I yeah. think that is true, so we, we won't get exactly what happened in the past, and because we know about the past, we may not allow some of those things to happen. On the other hand, we don't know what's coming. I, I'm, I'm lost at well, this point. Don't I'll ask tell me you what, predictions I'd like to, from me. So. I would like to meet with you again, maybe when you come to Port Palace. Yeah. <laughs> And we will continue this. Well, I think maybe I'll know a little bit more by then. Yes, we we'll all know. Right, right now, it's right. very gelatinous. Right. There's one other thing I'd like to mention. In 2006, you gave a, the most wonderful speech at the Worldcon in, in 2006, and it was about reading. One of the things you'd said that y you lost your mother, I'm sad to say, at an early age, mm -hmm. and that nobody would just would tell you the truth. And when you read books, they would just tell you the truth. They always tell you the They truth. didn't say it's fine, it all works out. Right. The books tell you the truth. And so I've asked if you wouldn't mind read a no, little of that I, speech. I would be happy to. Okay. Um, yeah, that I, I was talking about books and all the many things that they could do. Books can help you get through long nights and long trips, through the wait for the phone call and the judge's verdict and the doctor's diagnosis. Books can switch off your squirrel-caging mind and can make you forget your own troubles in the troubles of the characters that you read about. But it wasn't escape I needed when my mother died. It was the truth, and I couldn't get anyone to tell it to me. Instead, they said things like, there's a reason this happened, and you'll get over this, and God never sends us more than we can bear. Lies. All lies. I remember an aunt saying sagely, the good die young. Not exactly a motivation to behave myself. And more than one person telling me it's all part of God's plan. I remember thinking even at age 12, what kind of moron is God? I could come up with a better plan than this. And of course, the worst lie of all. It's all for the best. Everybody lied. Relatives, clergymen, friends. So it was a good thing that I had read so many books. Because I had James Agee's A Death in the Family, and Peter Be Beagle's A Fine and Private Place, and Peter DeVries's The Blood of the Lamb to tell me the truth. Time, time heals nothing, Peter DeVries said. And Marjorie Allingham said, mourning is not forgetting, it is an undoing. Every minute has to be untied and something permanent and valuable recovered and assimilated from the past. When I discovered science fiction a year later after my mom died, Robert Sheckley said, never try to explain to yourselves why some things happen and why other things don't happen. Don't ask and don't imagine that an explanation exists. Get it? And Bob Shaw's The Light of Other Days and John Crowley's Snow and Tom Godwin taught me that everything there is to know about death and memory and the cold equations. But there, is all, there were also hopeful messages in the books I read. There is a land of the living and a land of the dead, Thornton Wilder said, and the bridge is love, the only survival, the only meaning. And Dorothy in The Patchwork Girl of Oz said, never give up, 
You never know what's going to happen next. And C.S. Lewis said, if you look for truth, you may find comfort in the end. If you look for comfort, you will not get either comfort or truth, only soft soap and wishful thinking to begin and in the end despair. I found what I was looking for, what I needed, what I wanted, what I loved in books when I couldn't find it anywhere else. The public library and books saved my life and taught me the most important lesson that books have to teach. Wonderful. Thank you. I think that your writing is such a gift to us, and I want to remind our audience, if you're just starting on Connie, the best of Connie Willis, and if you want a delightful laugh and charming view of our information-saturated society, go for Crosstalk. Our guest today is Connie Wills Willis. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you. This has been a pleasure. Me too. And I'd like to thank you, our audience, for being with us today on Report from Santa Fe. We'll see you next week. Past archival programs of Report from Santa Fe are available at the website reportfromsantafe.com. If you have questions or comments, please email info at reportfromsantafe.com. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.